Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Victoria and today we will continue our pathology series on collagenosis with systemic sclerosis. As the other diseases, it is an autoimmune disease characterized by the proliferation of connective tissue which leads to sclerosing of the skin and internal organs. It is a rare disease with approximately 40 to 200 new cases annually worldwide. Females are, as with most of the other collagenosis also, more often affected, in this case approximately 3 to 5 times more often. This large estimation is due to undetected cases and regional differences. There are different types of systemic sclerosis, which we differentiate by progression and clinical appearance. If we take a look at the types differing in their progression, we can observe a limited distribution and a diffuse distribution. By clinical appearance, we differentiate the acral type, affecting the limbs, nose and ears, the proximal ascending type, arising from the fingers and climbing up the forearm and arm to the trunk, and the trunk sclerosing type, which is mainly characterized by internal organ involvement and sometimes presents without the pathognomic skin lesions. The pathophysiology is not completely understood yet, but a few processes are clear. As a sign of the immunological reaction, we can observe a decrease in T lymphocytes in the blood, as well as an increase in antinuclear antibodies which are characteristic for autoimmune diseases. Also inflammatory processes can be seen. So for example, the inflammatory proliferation of the extracellular matrix and the tunica intima of blood vessels, which is the innermost layer. This proliferation of latter can lead to an obstruction of the lumen, which in turn leads to circulation disorders and potentially ischemia of internal organs. The disease presents with different organ-specific symptoms. The skin lesions progress in three stages. The first stage presents with swelling and edema of the skin. The second stage presents with something called calcinosis cutis, the calcification of the skin and joints, where those become hard and calcified. The last stage is the atrophy of the skin. Extracutaneous symptoms affect the different organ systems. As much as 90% of patients experience GI symptoms, which are hypomotility of the esophagus, which in turn leads to dysphagia and reflux. 70% of patients have pulmonary manifestations, which are usually pulmonary fibrosis, alveolitis, pulmonary hypertension and pain. 45% of patients have also kidney-related symptoms, which are usually kidney infarction or insufficiency and arterial hypertension. Other systems affected are the locomotor system, where patients experience arthralgia or arthritis, symmetric synovitis and tendovaginitis. Also the salivary glands can be affected which is a cause of secondary Sjögren syndrome. The symptoms of the subform limited systemic sclerosis can be remembered with a mnemonic crest. C stands for calcinosis, so calcinosis cutis, the calcification of skin and joints, which I mentioned earlier. R stands for Raynaud syndrome, a specific vasospasm leading to white or bluish discoloration of the skin of the fingers and toes in response to cold or stress, leading to underperfusion. E stands for esophageal hypomobility, one of the GI symptoms, which leads to reflux and dysphagia. S stands for sclerodactyly, which literally means sclerosed fingers. This presents with thick and hardened skin of the fingers and hands, which limits mobility. T, the last letter, stands for teleangiectasis, a specific rash caused by dilation of capillaries, which is often observed in the face. C 
Systemic sclerosis is diagnosed by a thorough anamnesis and symptom-specific organ examination. In an electrophoresis, gamma globulins can be observed as being increased in the blood, antinuclear antibodies, short ANA, are high, as well as anticentromere antibodies, ACA. Anti-SCL70 and rheumatoid factor are also often heightened. Therapy depends on the subform and severity. Generally to be considered are avoidance of exposure to cold climate as this leads to visoconstriction and worsen circulation. Physiotherapy and lymph drainage can help with edema, which is observed in the first stage of the cutaneous involvement. Glucocorticoids, azathioprine, methotrexate, monoclonal antibodies, as well as pain management, are a few of the most frequently used medications for pharmacological treatment. Also, skin care by dermatologists can be helpful for patients and improve their symptoms. The prognosis of systemic sclerosis depends on the organ damage, especially for the kidneys, lungs and heart. Generally, the 5-year survival rate is at the point of diagnosis 85% and generally it is observed to be better for men than for women. Also to mention is that often with age, the frequency, duration and severity of exacerbations decreases. In the end, I want to compare the limited form of systemic sclerosis with the diffuse form. This is probably easier to follow along the poster. The skin involvement for the limited form is generally affecting the distal extremities, going from peripherally to centrally. In a diffuse form, the whole skin is affected and the involvement goes from centrally to peripherally. Raynaud's syndrome, one of the points of crest, is in the limited form often observed much before other clinical appearances sometimes even several years, while in the diffuse form, the symptoms often appear in the same time. The progression is generally slow in the limited form, rather constant and usually without or with less exacerbations. In the diffuse form, the progression is usually quicker and more exacerbating. The last point of comparison and the last point of this video is the laboratory diagnosis. In the limited form, we see increased anticentromere antibodies, while in the diffuse form, we usually see anti SCL70 antibodies. That's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Please subscribe, and hopefully, we we'll see you again in the next video. Thank you very much.